It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't fuck it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. Welcome, welcome. What's up, Buttercups? Welcome back to another fantastic episode of Mean Age Daydream. And uh, I have got a guest with me today I'm really excited to talk to. It is the one and the only Max Borders, who is an author with a new book we're going to talk about, Underthrow. Uh, also a former editor for Fee, which I'm sure everyone in our audience is very familiar with. And also has uh, some interesting thoughts about what I have termed freedom futurism, but just as uh, futurism in general about freedom and liberty. So Max Borders, welcome to Mean Age Daydream. I am delighted to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned in a, a little bit of our preamble, I have, you know, I saw in your in the initial uh, email and reading about you, you, you consider yourself a futurist, which I think is fantastic because a, like a lot of what's going on in our movement, you know, this movement toward freedom, or freedom and uh, freedom, God, my brain just gets out there, and decentralization and trying to convince people to our way of thinking to wean them off of the government teat, to wean them into a different way of thinking, it, you know, trying to achieve those goals tends not to happen as easily when all we're doing is tearing down rather than building up. And I think that what you're trying to do with these pretty you know pretty interesting descriptions of different power structures that are going to be more beneficial to humanity and growing that really leans into that so i just want to hear a little bit more about how you came around to where you're at now and then we can kind of segue into the book underthrow and uh, and the full title which i will read off momentarily <laughs> yeah absolutely so i i guess um i get i became really disaffected with uh the three what i call the three p's politics policy and punditry Right. In other words, everything is about shun sort of prodding the trying to prod the timid herds into the voting booth every two or four years and expect somehow that the tide, you know, that the that the that things are going to change through the electoral process. And that those those three narrow boxes really aren't um, we, we kind of. It causes us to beat our heads heads against the wall over and over again. And then we might rail about it on social media. But it occurred to me and, um, you know, on about the, the mid like 2010 or so, uh, for the first thing that happened was um, the Bitcoin white paper. Of course, uh, many of your listeners will be gold bugs. Many will be Bitcoiners. Suffice it to say, um, at least, you know, the gold bugs have a grudging respect for this idea of a sound money that is uh digitized in some way and distributed and, you know, very difficult to, to alter. Whereas right now, if, uh, you know, we're li li living under fiat regimes where everything is at the whims of central planners, essentially, um, and they don't have your best interest at heart, they have their own interest at heart and those of their, their cronies. So that, um, that was the first thing that, and, and, and really before that too, I was starting to get I was starting to feel uncomfortable with just with the three P's path. Um, there was also Uber there for a while where, where, and we still have Uber. It's still around, but this idea that you could operate within a legal gray area somehow and develop something new that could upend the taxi cartels, what are, what are known as medallions, those mm -hmm. systems, they had to begin to compete. And so this idea of markets and governance, Bitcoin is a kind of governance system. It only governs money uh, or currency, but we can start to imagine with all manner of different systems, how we might go from one system to another by choice. Someone might go from, you know, Facebook to Twitter because they're, you know, they like what Elon Musk's doing, or they might go from Twitter to Noster because they like the decentralized aspect of Noster. This set of protocols that you can op, you know, you can exit one set of protocols and enter another is, is real and gain rapid constituency groups really flips the logic of politics on its head. It starts to become really difficult to wrangle people into a monopoly system. If there's competition, the found the American founders knew this too, and they had federalism, right? Mm -hmm. So they really wanted states, right? So they could have 
50 op fit well it, 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 originally 13 opportunities to choose choose your best governance structure with a loose confederation among them so that's the idea the, the the really the core idea is how can we create new systems so people can exit the forgive my mouth shittier ones and enter into the better ones yeah, and, and I think that's, so it will segue into the book. Let me read off the full title here, uh, which is Underthrow, How Jefferson's Dangerous Idea Will Spark a New Revolution. And, you know, to your point, I do like, and this is why actually I, I appreciate Angela McArdle, the chair of the Libertarian Party. You know, there's there's obviously different state apparatus of Libertarian Party uh, iterations throughout. And many of them uh, now have taken a tact of being a little bit more inflammatory in some of their rhetoric. And there mm -hmm. is this kind of real time, uh, I mean, a you know, real time observation of whether or not it's being effective in growing the party, passing through the message, et cetera. You know, notably LP of Colorado, I think just got in some, got some flack. The uh, Libertarian Party of New Hampshire's Twitter feed had caused some flack, but I like that she also is saying, look, this is this is the opportunity for messaging. This is the, this is the testing battlegrounds for what's going to be the best ideas moving forward. Now, that, of course, is very different from states rights and, and governing. But at the same time, I do like that, you know, we have to have these alternatives. So when you talk about the book here and Jefferson's idea, tell me a little bit more about what conceptually is in that. I mean, are you laying out kind of different visions for how these markets will develop, how these alternatives would, would play out. You know, tell me a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. Well, let me let me just let me peg it for, for a moment to that subtitle since you so eloquently mentioned it and I appreciate your doing so. So what is De Jefferson's dangerous idea? It's actually right there uh, in, you know, everybody remembers the famous line about life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And he calls these rights. Now, we can quibble philosophically about whether these come from God or whether they come from, um, you know, state power or whatever, you know. But the essence of the idea is that people have these rights. And usually people who watch, uh, you know, who listen to or watch this show think we have rights and want to lay claim to them. The next line is about dissolving governments that aren't working. <laughs> and this whole line about the consent of the governed. And that's the peg. Dar um, the, the dangerous idea of, of Thomas Jefferson is this idea of consent, OK, which is fundamentally libertarian. Um, and so when you can start to create when you can start to create this idea of markets and governance, this idea of giving people more and more options, you reduce the costs, as we put it earlier, of exiting a bad system and entering a new system. And so really, the book is divided into basically three sections. The first is, is sort of the first section of the book is um, sort of diagnostic, how we're kind of trapped in the um, the duopoly. Um, this kind of like, uh, you know, this tug of war between warring tribes, um, you know, the red team and the blue team and all that jazz. And that's not doing us any good. Um, and really, this 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 whole idea of democracy, which is n uh, not to not not to um, uh, offend the, your show title, but gets lionized. OK, yeah. <laughs> democracy gets lionized in a way that I think is is, is quite inappropriate, because really it, it boils down to democracy being crying your teardrop in the ocean and expecting the tide to turn and wondering why it never does. Mm -hmm. So the diagnostic section of the first is like. America's coming apart. We're an empire. Uh, we're divided. You know, all the problems that surely your show is familiar with. And I try to articulate those in ways that that sort of make the case for what's so what's next. So in the um, in the in the subsequent two sections, um, I get more into this idea of what it would look like to have a consent based order where you take the Declaration of Independence. You accept the warnings of the anti-federalists. OK, so you have the Hamilton and Madison contingent, if you remember your history, mm -hmm. and they were all about a strong central government. And man, that was the that was the problem. Letting those guys sneak that stuff in there really in, in time. If you read Brutus one, for example, which I kind of summarize uh, a little bit in the book, um, Brutus one was this guy named Robert Yates. He's a founder that nobody ever remembers, but mm -hmm. he nailed it in Brutus one. Everything he predicted has come to pass. We have become a central authority, an empire um, based on special interests capture that is essentially um, 
a nation of, you know, 300 plus million people who find that they um, can't get along. And so elections become this game of shoving the one true way down everyone's throats. Why are we doing that? Let's stop playing that game and play a different game. This book is about the rules, making the rules of a different game. And so the punchline of the book then is how do we do that? What can we, what kind of things can we try? Subversive innovation being one of them. So instead of politics, policy, and punditry, we can enter into creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation, just like Satoshi Nakamoto of Bitcoin fame or Travis Kalanick of Uber or maybe the people who will uh, win the $25,000 contest that we have going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, let's talk uh, briefly. Let's dive into that because it, it does seem pretty interesting, this contest you're hosting to essentially create a new constitution focusing on the consent of the governed um, in how our government exactly. would operate. So tell me a little bit more about that. And actually, the timing couldn't be better because you're launching it on July 15th. This episode is probably going to come out. Uh, we're recording it on i think it's the 10th today <laughs> yes, uh, yes the 10th so it'll this will actually will come out probably a week after your contest launches because i have another show scheduled for next week so people can jump right in but yeah tell me a little bit more about this and um you know what what are you looking for i mean it consent of the government but people are going to hear that and go okay they're going to try to visualize what that would look like so tell me a little bit more of what you would envision you know is there a uh something that you have in mind that you are already kind of looking for yeah. So, well, first thing I would I would suggest that anybody interested in this would do because that's that's good money sitting there, right? Yeah. And there's smart people in your <laughs> yeah, and smart people in your audience. Like, let's think about this thing. Let's do it. Um, I would say go to underthrow.org. So I've got a Substack. Just go to underthrow.org, and you can e immediately subscribe for free. So I'd first say do that, okay? And in the subject line, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, nav bar is a link called contest, right? You can find the con uh, uh, the uh, con Constitution of Consent contest there in the nav bar, or you can, um, I'll probably keep uh, a, a, an article pinned about the contest as well so that it's not hard for people to find. But once you get in there and you get into that con um, Constitution of Consent contest page, you'll find a set of guidelines. And all of those guidelines, first they're like 25 diagnostics, basically, What's wrong with the social order now? What's wrong with the, the political order that, for better or worse, comes out of the current Constitution? And mm -hmm. let me just say, I deeply, deeply admire the American Constitution. But there are fudge phrases, weasel words, and people have played fast and loose throughout, throughout the, the, um, the decades and even the centuries with some of that language to that has allowed power to accrete in, at the federal level that is making it us a, a top heavy buckling empire, essentially. Um, so I'll go through these 25 diagnostics on, on the contest page, just sort of give people an idea what's wrong. Mm -hmm. What matches with those is a, a set of 25 suggestions, like what might go into a constitution of consent? Well, first of all, you, it would be, you know how people always talk about, the social contract says we should do this and it's whatever the hell they want to, to have you do to impose right. upon you. They, they justify it with the social contract. Like Lysander Spooner said, I never sign any contract. And so we're taking that Spooner rationale to its logical conclusion and saying, okay, but we can fashion at least for now in the cloud, right? In the, the, the digital cloud, a constitution that we can all agree to and mm -hmm. and be signatories to. We can pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor to that document that guarantees freedom, that guarantees us, the, if instantiated, and that's a big if, I'm under no illusions, the idea that we would be signatories to this. And so it would be a, it would function as a multilateral contract. You get enough signatories, after a while, you start getting you know two, three million people. That's the size of a small country that demands certain level of diplomatic recognition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and at least it gives us an object of reverence, something to point to and say, this is what we want. And so as you pointed out earlier, it's like, let's not just criticize, let's criticize by creating, right. creating this constitution will do that. And I want, we, we, we wanted to open the door to the smartest people in the world to try their hand at fashioning this, this uh, constitution. 
So I do wanted to, I did want to give people hints though. Those 25 hints, it's like, Hey, this oh, is going to be, you have to. Struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. No, I, I think that's absolutely the, the best way to move forward. And I'm really happy to hear that, that, that you, that's what you did because I mean, it's going to make it number one, far easier for people. And also, you know, with time constraints, having to go from scratch to try to create this document out of nothing would be unbelievably right. daunting for so many people. So you've really opened it up and laid the framework for people to just dive in. So I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to, to get into, so so the contest is open for people to create these constitutions. So as you said, it, it would demand some level of attention to have enough people sign on to it. Is there a concrete plan then if for the contest winner, they, when you choose it, is there then a, a plan in place to get boots on the ground? I mean, how would you treat this winner? How would you look to, to try to get this constitution out in front of people to spread the word? Is there going to be a, another publicity campaign or volunteers to try to um, you know, pass it around and, and get, you know, go door to door. I'm just, I'm curious what the next step would be. That's a, that's a really, really good question. And this is tentative. Okay. Um, I have a, actually a, a, an interesting guy funder out of Singapore who, who actually came up with the first $20,000 for the contest. Another funder, uh, who is a s subscriber to underthrow.org said, I love this so much. I want to throw in another 5,000. Thank you, Greg. If you're listening to this, <laughs> Uh, for for that extra five thousand, and of course uh, the Singaporean funder for the first for the first twenty thousand, the um, but the idea is is that the the next step uh, would be to um, to figure out what we've got. So mm -hmm. you got a lot of in entries. You're going to have one that's going to be the big winner because they're going to have the bulk of the good ideas. But you're going to have some, you know, a second place and a third place that are also going to have good ideas. We might want to integrate those. Yeah. So it would function like an open source software system, right? And with an open source system, you can merge code, you can fork code, you can do all kinds of stuff. We want to treat it like an open source system because that preserves the voluntary nature of it mm -hmm. down to its bones. So if people are like, we love this, we love it as is. They could take that, you know, we upload it into GitHub or something like that, something that facilitates the open source process and have start people having, you know, working on it in tandem, just as they would work on any uh, software code. Instead, it's legal code. Mm -hmm. So that would be the next step. Then the, the, the funder now, the guy, the, the guy who I persuaded to, to fund this, he's really thinking, I would like to see this instantiated somewhere on terra firma at some point in the future. Now, there's two different concepts here that are really interesting, and this is tr we're trying to move the change people's mindsets about the nature of constitutions as like conquerors making rules on on some territory, right? Mm -hmm. That's historically what it's always been. That's the Hobbesian way, right? Thomas Hobbes. But going forward, it's like we want to start getting people to think more and more people to think, why couldn't it be governance in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? Um I'm probably closer to Mexico than I am upstate New York right now. Well, actually, I used to be because I just moved out of Texas to here in South Carolina. And here I am talking about a constitution that would facilitate secessionism. Probably not the best look <laughs> being in South Carolina. But anyway, <laughs> um, point is, it's like, OK, if you can if you can, um, you know, um, why can't governance be in the cloud? Why can't we, we adjudicate constantly between jurisdictions of other countries, for example, Mexico and Canada and so on. They are to some degree, I know, uh, client states of the empire because mm -hmm. they kind of have to do what they're told because we, you know, elbow our way in around everything. But those days are numbered, I believe. In any case, adjudicating between jurisdictions, something happens all the time. Why can't I do that against my neighbor. So this is called polycentric law is the fancy term for it. And one of the best exponents of polycentric law is a guy named Tom W. Bell. Um, and an, another concept, an adjacent concept is called panarchy. And the idea is like, why can't you just sign up for your own governance system and live by it instead of having your party fight on your behalf to impose your rules on 350 million people? Why can't we have legal code in the cloud? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are territorial goods, things that we have to do with smaller jurisdictions. But at the very least, we shouldn't have 
one big giant jurisdiction, we should have 50. And if we can have more than 50 subsidiary jurisdictions within those 50 states, that gives more people opportunities to exit to a jurisdiction that comports with their concept of the good. Mm -hmm. And that's freedom, baby. Some yeah. people want to live in a less free state, but they're free to do so. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So this means we no longer have to go to war with each other. If you want to live, I mean, there are going to be some some deal breakers like basic rights, I think. But in terms of like, if you want to pay uh, a 10 percent tax versus a 15 percent tax in your jurisdiction, if you're if your system of governance is giving you something that you value at the higher tax rate, then go live in that system. Ain't nobody stopping you. It's yeah. just about resolving the frictions between systems. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I, and so so I was saying like so getting getting people to buy into this. Then um, I, I almost thought you were going to go down the route of some of these libertarian societies that have popped up. Like there was one I believe in Panama that the government then the uh, the government switched and I think they annexed them because they were trying to create this new uh, this new free land. So I thought you were going to say, well, he's got a little island somewhere that you're going to test it out on, <laughs> no, which would no, be nice. That's, <laughs> that's that's that that is that is a possibility. So yeah. um, uh, you know, I have friends in low places, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> one of those low places is down in Honduras called mm -hmm. Prospera. Okay, that's and that, that that's the one I was thinking of. I think Honduras. Yeah, yeah. And so um, pros they they changed the law. That, that may means that it, it may expire, but right now they're contractually obligated for the next five or so years. And if they can build up and continue to get investment to the extent that, that the Honduran government on the left sees the value in it, or they're getting tax revenues or they're getting whatever, it's really about getting Prospera, getting their um, special economic zone out of the corrupted law of mm -hmm. the wider country. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. They they may kick them out that that um, or they may shut them down to the point or make them comply with the laws such that it, they can't get foreign direct investment and then they disappear anyway. Yeah, that that would be really unfortunate because they're doing such good stuff there. Oh, it, I mean, it sounded awesome when I was listening to I mean, I was listening to the podcast about it and uh, an interview. I think actually we did. I think John Notermatt, my colleague, did it. Um, but again, you listen to so many podcasts, you forget what your own colleagues do. But um, it, that's always the fear, right, is that. And this is why leaning into the freedom futurism concept and trying to convince people of what's possible before trying to make it tangible in, in the real world is because I always fear what these government organizations will do to stop people from trying to, as you say, underthrow uh, their government and seeing like, you know, the change in government, how that can react and coming back around to getting people's minds around the concept of what's possible so that it becomes too too much of a cultural movement and as i've described it in the past almost a religious fervor towards the change you know this change that has to happen and you look at what happens on the left with some of these issues like transgenderism taking over the the conversation so prominently it is mind-boggling but getting people to buy into that extent to where they're willing to you know to wedge it in every conversation that they believe that this is ha this has to be done for the greatness of society and providing something that people can believe in that's so much better than what they have and i think that with the concept of the constitution that can be built in you know saying look this is so much better tangibly that you can't say no to this and this is going to solve all your problems, even if even if it might not necessarily be true. <laughs> like, it might not. But that's be. what we want them to believe. <laughs> we want them to believe that. We want to be able to make that case. We want right. people. You know, there was a time when the internet was such that nobody could, um, no one could even imagine social media. Um, and so, not only did we get social media, but we started getting migration among social media systems, and that's still happening. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people are signing up for Threads now you know, the knockoff of Twitter, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're still on Facebook, they might be on this other system and so on. And this idea of, of defecting from one system to join another one that you think is better or staying behind is a dynamic that should play out in this markets and governance concept. It's like, why shouldn't you live by your conception of the good, whether that's higher tax rate or low? Why shouldn't you live by your if you want to live in a kibbutz, you want to live in a commune? Great. Do it as long as you choose it and you can't impose that structure on everyone else. That's yeah. the difference. It's still libertarian, but everybody gets what they want. They just have to eat their own dog food as it right. were. Right. Well, that's um, what you're, and, you're talking about. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I just I just think it's 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 really about establishing that cultural 
that object of reverence in this new constitution in the same way that we, in, in a dwindling way, still respect the old constitution and the constitutional order that came out of the Declaration of Independence and these ideas that we constantly as a country have been trying to live up to since its inception. Um, that kind of power, you know, who the hell is this guy, you know, this crazy Max guy with his constitution contest, like who gives a shit, right? But I would say, I would say we've got to try. And man, that is my thing. Iterate, iterate, iterate. We've got to try stuff. We can, we got to build culture around it. Mm-hmm. There's a really interesting uh, guy that you got your listeners may have heard of called Balaji Srinivasan. Mm-hmm. And he's libertarian adjacent, he's, but he's definitely a freedom futurist. And Balaji is like, for me, you know, like a brother from an, another mother, but he has like 200,000 Twitter followers or some shit. I don't know. Some excuse, uh, excuse my memory on that, but he does have a lot of Twitter followers. And he's starting to sort of plant some of these mind viruses and people on this idea of competitive governance with his mm-hmm. book called The Network State. If the book, The Network State is a how-to manual for what, what I'm describing, mine's the why. Why should we do it? What is, the, what is the moral ethical basis of doing this? And how can we do it? How can we do it in this particular instantiation? Taken together, underthrow and, and um, The Network State are two... two uh, ideas that work in tandem i guess you could say yeah i, but, I definitely got to check that out as well and obviously you oh know, yeah I'm, I'm, i'll uh i'd love to grab a copy of your book and check that out too circle back with you but so let's let's talk a little bit more about your book and also a little bit more um you know like maybe for another, another 10 minutes or so because I, I apologize i have to run and get my kids <laughs> i don't want them sitting there the lonely, lonely on the curb you know <laughs> tears running down their faces um oh. so tell me a little bit more about a little bit more about some of the concepts in the book um and then additionally I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of what you've you've done as far as um, helping people to create decentralized communities and projects and things that, as we said, can inspire people as to what is possible right now that is inspiring. Because I'd love to share some of that with my audience as well, if you don't mind. Man, that is such a great question. So I want to t- kill two birds with one stone on that question, if you don't mind. So no, one of the things means- that... Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy uh, is a chapter in the book on uh, mutual aid. Uh, It's essentially uh, how we become the social safety net. Okay, Mm -hmm. Um, so um, so to answer, I didn't write about how we become the social uh, safety net in uh, this particular thing called a DISC, Distributed Income Support Cooperative, which would be basically putting a mutual aid society of the kind that used to be kicking around in the 19th century or the 18th, 19th centuries, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like the Freemasons, the odd fellows, the, you know, pick yourself, you know, it's, it's not pick yourself up by your brute straps, but rather we pick each other up when we're down and when we're not, we're able to be the ones who are picking up. Right. When you have a centralized state apparatus that dispense dispenses largesse as if by algorithm, dropping helicopter money from the sky onto people. Mm-hmm. There's nothing interpersonal about that. There's nothing communitarian, right? So people people don't realize this, but libertarians um, and, and are the most communitarian people under the sun because community is something that is fundamentally chosen and individuals fundamentally choose. But when we work together in community, lifting each other up when we need it, or giving people advice, hey, I'm not going to give you any money. We're not going to disperse funds from the kitty here to help you out until you put down the drink. Because mm-hmm. you showing up to work, you, the reason you got fired is you showed up to work every day drunk, right? So this idea of mutual aid is deeply, it's not just about independence, it's about interdependence. But true mm-hmm. interdependence has to be chosen as we self-organize into communities of practice. I want to bring that back. If we can bring that back through blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency mechanisms, great. We can do that at scale. But if we can't, I at very least want to bring back the um, the idea of the Freemasons, where you have initiatic experiences and community members where you look out for each other, yeah. fraternal or sororal or both. You know, it doesn't have to be just a bunch of dudes, although that can be cool you know, or just a bunch of women and that can be cool, whatever, whatever floats your boat and allows you to come together in communal, in a 
in a communitarian way for social uplift that is chosen, that is voluntary. This is the thing that is is tremendously promising to me about this idea, and it was and it would be something that I personally would want to see in a constitution of consent is a legal framework that facilitates the reemergence of mutual aid and dispatches with the, the welfare state, at least at the highest levels of government. If yeah. you want to live in a, a small jurisdiction that has a little welfare state, that's great. It's got to be sustainable, though. Right. But some may opt into mutual aid societies. And that's where we rediscover community. We, we get to know our neighbors. We look out for each other better. We, if you ever heard of the old barn raising aspect, right? Some, some mm -hmm. farmer burns down his barn and we become barn raisers again. We, everybody turns up and helps that old farmer get his barn back up. Excuse mm -hmm. my southernness, but um, <laughs> well, I you know don't worry. I grew up I grew up somewhere close to Amish country in PA, so they you you know, they, they raised barns there too. It's not they, just the they south. Sure, they sure do. They're the best. They're the best yeah. at it too. Um, well, I like so I, that, I, I one thing I want to add to this concept um, too. That it's interesting because you talk about the, the voluntary aspect of it and community building and mutual aid, but also there is a level of of responsibility as well and of judgment into who's going to be you know, permitted. And thus there is going to be some judgment as to whether or not you deserve to be a part of this community. Because if you're the right. one who is sucking out of the system constantly and you're not fully providing much in, and you said it's because of your, your own actions, you know, it's not just a hard look case. You said you show up drunk or you're addicted to drugs and whatever. There's the option to say, look, we're going to have a judgment on this. And it's not just what we have now, which is a blanket. No matter what you do, we're going to take care of you in this ever expanding net that's unsustainable. And I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting point as well Is it's a, you know, when you have the mutual aid society, it's a built in break on it getting too large in general, because it's coming out of people's pockets directly rather than manna from heaven. Um, you know, just, run the printing press and see what happens. So, I mean, I love the concept there is it, it governs itself to stop it from getting too, too uh, out of control. Right. And that, that really is, it's like rights and responsibilities ought to be tightly coupled. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in, in the, the liberal worldview, liberal as in freedom or libertarian worldview, whatever you like, right. The, 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 the a freedom based worldview, you have to have um, rights and responsibilities tightly coupled. If you don't, what you get are, very bad, slow infrared feedback mechanisms or no feedback mechanism like with the welfare state. Yep. Because the the welfare state doesn't oblige anyone to do anything. And the the corporation that runs it, GovCorp, is just a faceless corporation. It doesn't, it isn't human. It's an inhuman construct. Mutual right. aid societies are about hum, human beings coming together in brotherhood or sisterhood or both. And that is a beautiful thing. And then you get those, those feedback loops that are just right on the money because yeah. we're all looking out for each other. We're all having to look each other in the eyes. That's the kind of welfare system that we need in this country. So I have really, you asked me then about the other thing I've been trying to, I've been working on a concept uh, called the DISC distributed income support cooperative that would allow this to be an online thing mm -hmm. um, or a digital, digital, instantiation of a mutual aid society in the cloud, but I'm no coder. So if coders are listening, Hey, I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny. I was just thinking as you're talking about the faceless government institutions and how there used to be a little bit more shame involved in the welfare state in getting this aid and having to go in and not working and having to go physically to the welfare office to pick up your check. But now that has become completely digitized. And during the pandemic, especially, you had, you know, a, a card they send you in the mail and you just log on and it's a done deal. As you said, completely faceless and the elimination of shame. And I do appreciate the linkage that you had provided there between, as you said, rights and responsibilities and the loss of responsibility and, and personal responsibility to, as you said, friends and neighbors or just, I guess we've now as a society... Uh, and I believe this is intentionally pushed by the government uh, to erode what I call, you know, the family unit to erode communities because it only benefits the government if we, they erode those interpersonal communications and connections. Because then, not only is your truth uh, eliminated, you know, your sense of truth and reality is your community, or it was right. These people fact checked you; they kept you on your moral path, whatever the morality of that community might be, and they held you accountable. 
And through government breaking up families, providing this nanny state, it essentially has replaced that family and replaced truth and, and accountability. But having the rights and responsibilities tied in, I do think makes for much stronger communities. And I think also, as you said, gives people a sense of confidence in what is going on around them and the people that are around them to the point where you're not going to have as much divisiveness within communities anymore because you are forced to depend on each other by virtue of, you know, everybody's got their, each other's ass and, you know, you're forced into cooperation. So you're going to be less less hasty to jump into calling somebody a, a son of a bitch bastard for not getting a, a shot or for not right. having a Black Lives Matter sign in their front yard. It, it, it'll, it'll happen, right? We're human beings. It's going to happen. But it's going to happen to such a far uh, lesser degree. Think about how we act when we have a sock puppet account on Twitter versus when yeah. we're face to face with each other. Totally different. Totally different. Uh, if you have an avatar of yourself that you can hide behind pseudonymously, mm -hmm. um, if you don't have any kind of reputation capital associated with that pseudonym or that uh, pseudonymous identity, then you're going to act, act act like a, a chimp or a troll or whatever. Yeah. And that's that's can be socially destructive. Um, it is socially destructive, I think, and it's probably part uh, part and parcel to why we have such problems right now in this country in terms of, uh, you know, people living on social media and um, expressing their displeasure with the state of the world through the apparatus of social media and and the low impact idea of voting. I mean, that's all we've got. Yeah. So so we're ra we're rats in a cage being, um, you know, trying to figure out why we can't self organize. And it's because we have these blinders on this idea that this is the that, that this is the end of the road. This is the only system we've got. This democracy thing. It's all mm. you know that we got to figure out how to do it. We're gonna have to persuade a whole bunch of people to vote for one guy who's gonna save us. You know that's and it never happens. All of these sociopaths are are completely captured by special interests anyway. So the whole voting in elections thing. And while I'm I'm totally you know I'm behind uh, you know the LP that. LPs can be is full of crazies. We all know it, but they're they're you know going, moving towards this decentralization project. I think is good at least at the margins. And so my contribution to the effort, while not political, in the same way, is to say we got to start developing a culture around the consent of the governed and show people show people that there are actual systems that can do it. And hell, we need right. to start building them in parallel and joining them so that when they start rolling out the central bank digital currencies or the economy collapses or both. We're ready and we have the systems in parallel that we can move into. Um, Absolutely. And, and start looking out for each other. Absolutely. And, you know, as I, I mentioned, my my kiddos, I have without a doubt after now becoming a parent you have two girls, what I think about a lot is looking and seeing how these things are, are collapsing again digital currencies looking at the empire expanding and how it, it you know it, i do not have bright prospects for governance as it exists and I'm, I'm constantly thinking where would i go where does it where does a government system exist where i would be happy and feel safe and that is such a good point and a salient point that we have to build the systems while we still can because the end of the road is coming and we have to have a different track to get the train onto and so you know, instead of whining about what's going on right now, we have to focus on building a new reality. Absolutely. Be beautifully said, Brian. That is exactly right. And I know that sounds like crazy agorism, but that's to me, that's what it's all about. It's about techno yeah. agorism, where if you can apply technology and innovation to some of these projects, great, because that's going to allow you to pull in rapidly pull in uh, constituency groups mm -hmm. um, where where before it would take a long time. And um, that, you know, as long as we still have surpluses to, to deal with the parallel systems and maybe it's, it's really about time. It's a factor of time. It's, you know, it's like, I think about all these other social media things that I could be joining and I'm like, I just don't have the time for all that. Yeah. So I kind of, so those trade-offs are very real. But we got to do the best we can. We have got to try. We got to start doing more than politics, policy, and punditry. We've got to start doing creativity, entrepreneurship, and innovation, even if that's just supporting the innovators who are trying stuff. And um, 
and I call them subversive innovators in the, in the book. I love it. Well, Max, this has been an awesome conversation. As I said, I will definitely read the book. I encourage everybody else out there to read the book as well. And I'll link to that in the show notes. Again, guys, the book is Underthrow, How Jefferson's Dangerous Idea Will Spark a New Revolution. Uh, also, of course, go to underthrow.org and get uh, details on the contest. Join the contest. And uh, I'm excited to see what comes of this. I mean, this is this is really awesome. And as I said, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch. I'd love to have you on, you know, to kind of check in and, and see where we're at. Now, when does the contest end, by the way? I know it starts on the 15th. Is there a window of time, a, a few months, or how long is it going for? Yep, it'll last three months. So um, those who subscribe free to Underthrow, they can uh, get updates I'll send out constant reminders, you know, so when we're a month out or two weeks out, I'll say, don't forget, get those constitutions in. Don't leave that $25,000 on the table. Got it. All right. I love it. Well, thank you for joining me here on Me and Age Daydream, and uh, we will catch up soon. Thank you, Max. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. Hey guys, second half of the show here. By the way, uh, I do want to tell you about a event coming up, a very special event, which is of course the porch tour with Robbie, the fire Bernstein. I'm going to be hosting it at my house, September 9th. I will put a link to the tickets in the show notes here, but you can come on out, see me slang some jokes. Of course, Robbie will slang some jokes and then we will do a live podcast. That'll be here on uh, mean age daydream as well as on Robbie's Run Your Mouth podcast. So don't miss out. We did it last year. It was an absolute blast. We got shit-faced and uh, had a wonderful time. And then afterwards, went to the bar for some other drinks. So make sure to come out. Hopefully my house isn't torn to the ground because I am doing construction during the time, but we'll make it work and have a wonderful time. And that way you animals can't do any damage to it. (laughs) Really, It's the perfect end to a a perfect day. So check that out. Look into the show notes. All right, so second half of the show, just a little, little costume change here because it's a different day. Wanted to add on some current event stuff after I spoke with Max, and I'm glad I did because there's a lot to talk about. First things first, I will give my quick take here on the fallout from Tucker Carlson and the Blaze having their presidential forum debate, which, of course, Donald Trump did not take part in. Now, he wasn't expected to. And I had said that there was some risk involved for Trump, namely in that Tucker Carlson has such a massive audience that the risk really laid in whether or not some of these other candidates would be able to get some traction and whether or not Tucker Carlson would have laid into Trump during this event. And interestingly enough, I mean, the fear here was that Donald Trump would go in against Tucker Carlson, who, by the way, is on record saying that he is not a fan of Donald Trump. You know, that came out in the uh, the evidence in the lawsuit over the Dominion lawsuits with Fox News. And he's in there pretty much saying, I don't I hate Donald Trump. I'm not a big fan of his at all. Now, people have also pointed to them palling around at the Turning Point USA event. And somehow this is an indicator that they're best of friends, because I had also tweeted out today that Donald Trump was afraid of Tucker Carlson because Tucker Carlson is the most dangerous man in conservative politics. Why? Well, because he's already being paid by Fox News. And we'll see what happens with this because he just got a new investor, uh, this guy from Public Square who's investing uh, God knows how much, millions, I'm sure. And um, Omid Malik, I think his name is. I'm probably butchering his name. But that news just came out. So Tucker Carlson is going to launch his own media channel. And... TBD, how that's going to work out with his contract with Fox. Because presumptively, Fox, even though they said, hey, we don't want you to do your thing on Twitter, that was protected under free speech because he's not actually doing a show. He's not selling advertisements. But now, I don't know what's going on there. If he's going to be selling ad space, if he's going to be taking backers to start a new media empire, presumably that would go against whatever contract he has with Fox. But as of now, though, his contract's being paid. Um, so that makes him dangerous in that he really doesn't have much to lose because he doesn't have another job lined up with the corporate media outlet, nor would he want one. He's on record saying, I don't want to go to another, you know, CNN or Fox again. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to be his own boss. He doesn't want to take anybody's marching orders. So that makes him dangerous in that respect. 
He's also dangerous because he is a free thinker. He's not thinking inside of the box that all these other operatives are working within from the political class, from the commentary class. He's willing to say things that others aren't. He's willing to ask questions that others aren't as evidenced by what happened at this presidential forum where, I mean, I would say without a doubt, even though some people are trying to provide cover for Mike Pence and say, well, Mike Pence didn't mean to say it wasn't his concern and indicate it really sounded like he was indicating when when asked about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine by Tucker Carlson about why we should be worried about sending tanks and bombs to Ukraine when you can't walk through American cities without stepping in shit or uh, needles or have homeless people threaten your children's lives. Mike Pence responded with, well, that's not my concern. <laughs> now, I don't care where Mike Pence is coming from. It was an idiotic moment. Clearly. That's the way it was going to be taken, and that's the way it was. And his his presidential candidacy is now dead in the water. It didn't have much of a chance to begin with, nor did uh, the the, you know, the other gal that was running. I can't even remember. She, you know, some state senator, Tim Scott, as an also ran. Tim Scott, I think, is basically running for the vice presidency. Vivek Ramaswamy came out of this very well, but the, but the thing was, Tucker did give a little bit of the kid glove treatment to to Ramaswamy. He actually he obviously loves the guy. He's a fan. Uh, Nikki Haley, I would say, didn't have the best showing. She she didn't come across that well to me. Tucker could have put her in the ground farther, but still, I don't think she's coming out looking strong, and Trump's not going to tap her for a VB candidacy because he feels betrayed by her since she has, had been you know, working for him, and Trump had put her in her position as uh, as his, his liaison. So it was interesting, though, to see that Tucker really didn't go after Trump at this event, nor did anyone else. And... What was odd was that, be, you know, the danger of a, a person like Tr Tucker is that he will ask these questions that will put you right on the spot to your face. And for someone like Trump, coming out of this event, oh, and also I, I neglected to mention DeSantis. DeSantis was fine. Uh, you know, nothing, nothing really impressive, takeaway from it, nothing really bad. Uh, again, Tucker didn't really press him on certain issues as much as he could have in regards to, for example, Ukraine. But again, it was a shorter forum, too. He was talking to fairly fairly short format with all these different candidates. Now, Trump didn't take part. And I had said because he was scared of Tucker, seeing what would happen to a Mike Pence, seeing what could happen to a Tim Scott, seeing what could happen to this other gal. I just can't remember her name at the moment, but she's pulling at point zero one, so who gives a damn anyway? The fact that Tucker does have the ability to put you in a position where he can come at you left field with a question you're not going to expect, as opposed to somebody like a CNN, where Trump is completely comfortable doing that forum, that environment, because he knows it's an adversarial environment going in, and he can position it that way. He can go, you're a very nasty lady. Oh, you're a very mean, you know, you're a terrible person. Okay, fine. His base will lean into that. They'll eat it up. Whereas you can't do that to Tucker. Because he's the most powerful voice in the movement. He has the audience. He has the poll. He has their ear. He was the number one show. Now his show has exponentially grown since he's let, since Fox News let him go. He has an even bigger audience. So Trump knows this. And as I had posited, Trump is scared of Tucker. Now, people are pointing out to that, well, Trump praised him at the Turning Point USA event. He said that Tucker went from a 6 to a 10. Okay. That, and that's supposed to tell me that he's not afraid of him. If anything, that to me tells me that he is exactly afraid of him. And now Trump's trying to feather that nest. He's trying to say, well, let's let's, let's be friends. Let me get you back on my side here. I'm going to praise you up and down and to make sure that you know that I'm on your side, buddy. I got your back. Now, God knows what's going on behind the scenes, because I still think it was strange that Tucker Carlson is battling with Chris Christie about Chris Christie not taking part in this event. And Chris Christie is also worthless and, and has no bearing on the election. If anything, I think most Republicans that are going to vote view Chris Christie as a traitor, as a joke. I mean, Chris Christie is in no way a true conservative. So they're not going to take much salt in him. He's basically, you know, getting his fat ass on MSNBC and that's about it. But it's curious that Tucker Carlson isn't taking shots at Trump in the same way. Is it because Tucker Carlson thinks he, he'll somehow lose fans from this? Maybe. 
But considering how many people watch his show from all walks, and again, now don't forget, Tucker Carlson also pulled people from the Democratic viewing side of things. He pulled people from the independents, from libertarians. It's not just GOP. So if he is trying to walk that line of not being critical of Trump, that actually could come back and hurt Tucker far more than simply being himself to begin with. But it was very strange to see. And the warnings that I had for, for Trump to skipping and skipping this event, basically that you look like a giant puss, which I still think he does. And he still looks like he's scared of, of facing Tucker Carlson and maybe rightly so. I am still perplexed by the fact that even during the event, Trump was not mentioned. He, it was like, it was like Voldemort. You don't want to say Voldemort's name, even though the guy was going to be at the next event the next day where Tucker Carlson was speaking, where Ramaswamy was speaking and where Trump spoke. It's, it's interesting to watch. I'll tell you that much. It's interesting to watch this play out. And I also was diagnosing a little bit this VP candidacy spot. Obviously, Trump hasn't named anybody. It ain't going to be Nikki Haley. Would it be Tim Scott? Maybe. I don't think that would be very popular with the base personally, but maybe. And now, and I tweeted this out today too, I think it might be Vivek. I think he actually makes a lot of sense as a VP candidate. He's young. He's a businessman. He's an entrepreneur, right? The guy that Trump's going to have respect for. He has a high intellect. He's saying all the right things within the base that Trump would appeal to. Again, that crosses over with libertarianism in a lot of ways. But Vivek also separates from what we like, you know, from, from our point of view in some of the stuff he said about drone bombings in Mexico and some of the more, a little bit more neocon points. But at the same time, if Vivek, who came out of this really skyrocketing upwards and is going to eat into what DeSantis has to offer, well, if Trump's going to say, well, DeSantis isn't really that much of a threat to me, Vivek, if I add him to my my base here, if I can add his his uh, youth and exuberance onto my campaign, I bring in a guy that's not of the political class, he's an outsider like me, unlike a DeSantis, unlike a Tim Scott, unlike a Nikki Haley, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. So a lot of time left. These still out a year, so we'll see. But that's a quick thoughts. But I I, uh, I still do think that Trump fears Tucker Carlson, what Tucker Carlson could do in uh, in submarining his campaign should things come down to it. So watch what their interactions are. All right, next thing I want to talk about, guys. I got, Let me share this clip because it was so interesting to see Adam Devine or Devine? Uh, Adam Devine, I don't know, whatever well, you say his fucking name. The comedic actor who was in uh, the the wonderful show on Comedy Central where they were working. <laughs> I can't remember the fucking name of the show. I can't remember anything right now. My brain is it just doesn't work. I, it's, I give it up. Well, here it is anyway. Let me just play it and uh, <laughs> you'll know who he is. He is the guy that uh, famously... It was in the, the karaoke films out there. I was saying, from podcast listeners, it's driving me insane when I can't think of this show on Comedy Central where there are a bunch of fucking dingleberries working in the office. I'll just have to Google it after I play this, but here you go. My job now is kind of, well, obviously acting and that kind of stuff, but then like I'm pitching a lot, so I'll like pitch movies. Uh, and every executive is like, yeah, but why should we make this movie now? And you're like, because it's funny. Yeah. Because it's funny, bitch. What do you mean? <laughs> like, whatever happened to just, like, we want to make people laugh. Like, it doesn't need to be... Right. Yeah. Right. There, It doesn't need to attach itself to some, like, hook in the world right now. It doesn't. I mean, if it does and that's the movie, then sure. Right. But it doesn't always have to. It no. could just be, like, whatever happened to just, it's funny for funny's sake. I know. My job now is kind of... So there you go. Workaholics. That's the name of it. It's called Workaholics. And my computer, for some reason, is still slowing down when I try to play video clips. It's very aggravating. So he was on Workaholics. That's where he kind of got his kick. But he makes such a good point there. And one that I have noticed, and anybody trying to sell anything in the industry has noticed, and probably anybody going to the movies has noticed, in that they keep force-feeding this woke garbage, you know, basically films that have to have some social cause out into the public sphere and expect us all to just eat them up and be like, oh, thank God this had a social message in the comedy I'm watching. I don't know what I would have done without it. If it didn't have a, a race message or a anti-fat message, what would I, how would I have enjoyed this comedy? Just make shit that's funny again and we'll go see it. 
I've talked about this previously, how the guy who did the Joker, the director of the Joker, and now the Joker 2 coming out, which is a very dark, dark film, also had directed and written the first three Hangover movies. He'll no longer make comedies anymore. Three of the funniest comedies you're going to find out there. Well, you know, they got less funny as they went along, but still dirty, raunchy, un-PC, just gut laughter comedies no longer will be, will be made by this man because he said it's not worth doing it because the PC crap has gotten in the way. You can't just make anything that's funny anymore. It gets dissected and ripped apart. And again, why are you, why, why this film now? Because it's funny. So thank you to Adam Devine for standing up and saying that. Now watch, it'll never work again in Hollywood. <laughs> Meanwhile, they have the actor strike going on. So, you know, a lot of competition for OnlyFans girls with these out-of-work actors. But the other thing I want to talk about, kind of tying into this, they're remaking Snow White. Now, Disney, I just talked about last episode. This, this company can't seem to get out of its own fucking way with the stupidity of its executives. So now, coming off of The Little Mermaid, which was a bomb, Coming off of Indiana Jones, which is a mega bomb. Coming off of Elemental, which is a bomb. So Little Mermaid had a good opening weekend. That was about it. They made the Little Mermaid black. Whatever, man. I don't know. The Little Mermaid, even though she still had red hair, fine. But at least the Little Mermaid's core character wasn't supposed well, didn't have to be white. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It didn't have to be white. I'm gonna read you. The line from the grim fairy tale, Snow White, Little Snow White. That's what it's called by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, right? This is the, the most famous movie in the lexicon of Disney. They still have a whole, you know, multiple rides dedicated to it and is the film that set it all off. So this is just one line. Soon afterward, she had a little daughter who was white as snow as red as blood and as black as ebony wood. And therefore they called her little snow white. The character is named little snow white because she has skin that is snow white. That's the fucking character. If it was a uh, little, little ebony black, then th that would be a black girl. Fine. If it was little, uh, little Coco <laughs> Chanel, <laughs> then you could have a Latina in there or whatever it might be with her skin as brown as brown rice, whatever. When it says Snow White in there for the character description, it makes it a little bit conspicuous when you turn the character from a white chick for no fucking reason whatsoever, other than woke virtue signaling into a Hispanic chick, into a Latina chick, which is what happened here. And the, the star of this new film is, uh, the same gal that was the, in the remake of uh, West side story, which I actually heard was good. And her name is, uh, what's it? Ziegler. Where the fuck's her first name? Anna Ziegler, Rachel Ziegler, Rachel Ziegler. So Rachel Ziegler is now the, the star and I'll share this picture and hopefully my screen doesn't crap out like it has been doing the last eight times, but, oh, great. Now I can't find it. There we go. So let me share this picture of the, the Snow White and the Seven Doors. Now this doesn't have Snow White in it, but this was a leaked photo from the set. Now the, the woman pictured on the left is not Rachel Ziegler. That is a stand-in, but the dwarves on the right are the dwarves. Now, you'll notice that only one of them is a dwarf. Just the guy in the front. He's got long hair and a little beard and a little one little tiny arm, but he's a dwarf. The rest of them are, I would describe one of them as short and the other ones as scumbags who legitimately look like they should be robbing Walmarts in the, the uh, Tenderloin district in San Francisco. The guy at the very end is a man dressed in some sort of, uh, I don't know, Russian looking pishma you know, head wrap. Well, he is apparently a foot taller than all the other dwarves who are, by the way, one white man who is probably going to be transgender in this, a black chick, another black I think a man 
a white chunky dude, another white chunky dude, and another black man. Conspicuously, no Indians involved here. No Asians, because clearly they're using the Harvard model of casting over at Disney. So no Asian dwarves, even though we all know the Asians are the shorties of the bunch. So why, why no Asians? You could have just hired, look at this way. If you wanted to help the world, all right, and Lou Perez had a funny joke that, you know, six dwarves are out of work here because they decided to not have dwarves in it, which, by the way, in the original story, also dwarves. It wasn't called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but there were dwarves explicitly listed in the, in the first book. You could have given this job to North Koreans who are notably short because they're so malnourished. That's a double win. Number one, you're fostering better connections with North Korea. Maybe you're opening that market up, right? Because in the wake of losing Russia as a major market, which they're saying is one of the reasons Dial of Destiny isn't doing so well, right? And the Chinese market becoming so difficult. Well, maybe the North Korean market will open itself up if you have, you know, seven North Korean dwarves who just, you don't even have to, you don't have to call them dwarves. They're just tiny because they don't have anything to eat. Maybe, maybe uh, the nukes will get turned back inwards. Give these people a little, little bone. But still, it's one of the more ridiculous casts. And coming out of this situation where everybody has stopped going to see Disney films because they're so woke, these morons think that the best thing to do would be to virtue signal woke cast something in one of the most comedic sense. Like, this is a, legitimately, this is something that you would find in the Babylon Bee. You can't cast something this ridiculous, this fucking absurd, without it rolling eyes. It'd be like, I, I mean, I don't know what reality you would live in where you think this would be a great idea to change the lead character of Snow White to a Latin chick and just expect people to be like, oh, okay, cool. What's your response? That you people are racist? No, it's not racist to point out that the fucking character is supposed to be white explicitly. It's racist to change that character. That seems racist. That seems like you hate white people. It's just fucking unbelievable. It's fucking unbelievable. I mean, especially the one dwarf, you know, like I said, a giant man who I guarantee you is going to be transgender in the movie. And then when asked about this, the lead actress said, well, you know, well, we're changing the script a lot. It's not really the story of Snow White anymore. Okay, they don't fucking call it Snow White. Don't pretend it's the same IP then. Make a new movie. If you're going to do that, if you're going to change the whole story around, if you're going to ignore the basis of the characters, if you're going to ignore the descriptions and casting of the characters and completely fuck it all around, don't call it Snow White. Call it something different and make a new movie. How about just make new movies in general? How about just make new movies? Great. I can't run out of focus because I'm gesturing too wildly. It's very annoying. It's not a new idea just because you change the fucking races around. It's not a new idea. Oh, and also, Snow White is no longer, they said this, she's no longer just going to be lying around waiting for her prince to come. Remember that famous song, Someday My Prince Will Come? No, no, they changed that too. Because, you know, women have to be fierce. So, little Latin X uh, and the six non-multicultural dwarves and one real dwarf and the story of female empowerment. That's what it's called now. So, Get your tickets now. Oh, and by the way, Disney knew this was so fucked and so bad and would generate so much horrible publicity that they lied about this photo coming out. They said that it was not a photo from the production, which is one of the most bafflingly idiotic PR moves I've ever seen in my life. Because what, what possible hope do you have of spinning that story if you're denying it? My man... You have an entire film cast and crew, which is now out of work, by the way, waiting, unless this thing, unless this thing's already in the can. But either way, people are going to find out unless you're going to take another tax write off Disney, yet another scrapped project to save money because you know, you're just going to lose it. So you might as well save it. I mean, I, I legitimately, if I was a Disney exec, I would legitimately give this the Batwoman Warner Brothers treatment, take it out old Yeller style in the backyard put a shotgun to its mouth and blow its head off and start again. This movie is dead in the water. 100% dead in the water. It has no chance of making money. I'm saying it right now, no chance of making money. They should kill it, just like Warner Brothers do with Batgirl. Take the loss and start over with something new. Either a authentic 
to the story, to the, or to the origin IP remake or something brand spanking new. How about that? Can you do anything new, Disney? Because right now, you're digging a hole, and I don't think they're going to climb out of it anytime soon. All right, guys. That's about it. I think that wraps up. Oh, one more quick thing. Uh, the House passed a defense bill with restrictions on abortion and transgender procedures. This makes sense to me. They were flying people around to, to get abortions in states that would allow them if they're military members. That seems idiotic to me. I mean, again, it's my tax dollars just for what? To fly people to states with abortions because they were careless enough to get pregnant while in the military? Wonderful. And then finally, they stopped paying for people to transition from one gender to the other, other or their family members under a provision that was like special needs in for people in the military. They, they put a stop to that. Now we'll see what happens in the Senate because the House passed this, not the Senate. But thank you for at least some sanity coming in here. I don't need to be paying for people to fucking change genders because they joined the military, which by the way, just means people are going to join the military just to get the surgery to change genders. And also, how long are they going to be laid out getting the, getting the surgeries? I mean, it just, <laughs> just beyond stupid. The, the shit that gets lumped into this because you want to join the military. Now you say you're a, you're a woman or a man. All right, that's it, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. I am not going to be around for Meme Wars this week. I will be out of town in Yosemite uh, for a bachelor party getting drunk in the woods because where is a better place to have a bachelor party than uh, in the middle of the woods with 15 other men and uh, and no beautiful women around, but maybe one sexy bear in a bikini. I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to shave one. I'll let you know what it looks like. All right, from me, Brian McWilliams, from the Lions of Liberty Network and from Mean Age Daydream and also from, of course, Max Borders. Check out his competition and, of course, check out Underthrow. I have been Brian McWilliams. Keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head. Oh, no, I fucked it up! <laughs>